Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another beautiful Sunday morning. Spring is trying to come here. It's a little frozen on my windshield. Disappointed about that, but it's coming. <laughs> I'd like to invite you all to stand with us as we worship God today.
Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Lord God, this morning, as we come before you to worship you today, Lord, we come into your presence and we, we hope to meet you. But Lord, even if we don't feel anything special today, 
we have gathered first and foremost to worship you because you are our God and you are worthy of our worship, regardless of our experience in your midst. We want to come before you and just lift up your name. We want to praise you. We want to thank you for your mighty works. Lord, and even as we sung, we know that sometimes we don't see it, but you are still at work. And we are so thankful for that. Lord, to know that that which we have committed to you is kept in you, and you are faithful. Lord, I pray this morning as we come before you to worship, help us, Lord, to free our hearts, free our minds from the concerns of the weeks past and the anxieties for the week that is ahead, and just be present in this moment before you to know you. Bless your people this morning, Lord, whether they be with us in person or joining us online. I pray, Lord, you would bless your people as we seek to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. While you're standing, I invite you to turn around, see who you're worshiping with today, and give some greetings. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. And when you're done, I would invite you to take your seats and just grab your bulletins. If you are joining us online, our bulletins can be found on our website at fortmcleodalliancechurch.com. And for those of you who worship through giving of tithes and offerings, we have a box at the back of the church, and we also have information on in our bulletins on e-transfers and online giving as well. So if you have your bulletins, the first thing this morning is I want to say a big thank you to Tanya and the Hospitality Committee for all of their work in the uh, potluck last Sunday. It was a wonderful uh, afternoon. Yeah, you can give them a hand. It was a great afternoon, and for all of you who joined in and took part and were helping set up and clean up, that was great to see. We do have one missing in action point, though, from our potluck, if you noticed it in the bulletin. Somebody went home with the wrong crock pot lid. Now, it could be that you sent your husband to pick it up, and he doesn't know a crock pot lid from any other kind of lid, and you haven't looked yet. So if you are at, check at home, if you've got the wrong lid, uh, we, the right one is back here, and we want to reunite all of the lids with the crock pots so that they're all working again. So just uh, check into that when you go home. Uh, for those of you who are part of the When Helping Hurts small group, their second session will be tonight here at the church at 7 o'clock. Um, also right after the service today is a Plan to Protect Refresher uh, session. So you information is in the bulletin there regarding that. So for those of you who need your Plan to Protect for this year, uh, please uh, see Purdy in the fellowship hall after the service this morning. Uh, this coming week, I will be away on holidays from April 4th to 11th. So we just ask that you would contact either the church office or one of the elders, Murray, Daryl, Brent, or Jacob, uh, regarding any church matters during that time. And if need be, they will, they will know how to track me down and get a hold of me. But I will be out of the office from the 4th to the 11th. And then uh, Purdy's actually taking some holidays for the rest of the month, uh, April 13th to 29th, so just bear that in mind. I will be back then, but my schedule in the building is often quite sporadic. So you might want to phone in advance if you need to get into the building or get a hold of me on my cell phone to, uh, to track me down. Uh, Meals on Wheels are scheduled for April 25th to 29th. If you're able to help out with that, uh, please contact Purdy by uh, April 10th. Also notice that we have a congregational meeting on April 27th, the Wednesday night here at the church, uh, so information on that. Discovery Land will get dismissed today just before the uh, service, and the rest of the uh, 
items you can see in the bulletin and, and read for yourself as far as our events for blast and youth and ladies and men's ministry. And you'll see for those of you planning your summer, um, trustfully you will keep the uh, weekend of August 5th to 7th open as we're planning a church camp out for that time. So those are the announcements and the happenings going on in our church, at least the ones that I know about. And with that, we will turn our time of worship back over to the music team. I love you, Lord. All your mercy never fails me.
Ecclesiastes 12. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look through the windows are dimmed, and the doors of the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low, and one rises up at the sound of bird, and all the daughters of song, song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high, and the terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and the desire fails, because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. 
Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings that we are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these, for making many books there is no need. For much study is a weariness of the flesh. In the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every single thing, whether good or evil. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you that we're able to gather here, and I pray that uh, we can continue to do that. And Lord, I pray that you continue to guide, protect us, help us that we, we see what you want done and not what we want to do. And I pray for, uh, at the Ukraine, that there can be peace, that this can end and the, the, just the bloodshed will stop. And Lord, I pray you guide, lead the leaders that they will do what you want done and not uh, what man thinks it should do, but your will be done. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I pray you continue to, to just be with those who were baptized last week, guide, protect them and help them as they continue in their journey with you. And I pray you continue to be with Kevin, guide and protect him, help him that the words he speaks up here will be your words and that he can just continue to, to uh, allow you to be his, his leader and, and his guide. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
Let's pray. Discovery Land. For those of you who are off to Discovery Land, just want to invite you to head on out and find your teachers there. Is there an age limit? I don't, you might be a little bit too much for them to handle. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord God, as we continue to worship you through your word, I pray, Lord, where my words may lack clarity, you may bring clarity, that your spirit would have freedom amongst us to speak. Lord, I just pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart would be acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I couldn't remember what the commercial was actually for, so so much for marketing. Uh, maybe some of you will remember and tell me afterwards. Uh, it was some kind of financial commercial. But it was a commercial where the older self returned to give the younger self advice on how to make their future better. And it was kind of an amusing commercial. You see them later in life, and of course, because they gave the advice, they gave all these good decisions, and they had a much more comfortable and positive future. It's an intriguing concept that one occasionally muses over. If I could go back 20 years or 30 years and give myself a piece of advice, what might that be? Or perhaps you have made that statement before where you've said, if I knew then what I know now, then this would be so much different. In many ways, that has been what our time in Ecclesiastes has been about. Only King Solomon hasn't been speaking to a younger version of himself, but rather words of wisdom from his aged perspective later in life about how life works and what really matters for us. He's speaking not to his younger self, but really to the rest of us, who are probably at a much younger or earlier point on our journey than he was at the time of this writing. His conclusion of it all, as he comes into chapter 8, we read the phrase once again that we have seen over and over again in Ecclesiastes. Hebel of Hebels. It's a Hebrew word. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity meaning it's a mist, a vapor, temporary, transitory. Nothing is lasting or permanent in this life under the sun. It is all a chasing after the wind. And we live with worry, work, sleepless nights, suffering, injustice, oppression. We live with all sorts of endings that we experience just as part of living in this world. And yet in the midst of this, in the midst of all of this, that Solomon, his observations of life under the sun, he has told us through the Spirit of God that it is possible to know joy and impossible even to enjoy this life that we have been given. But that that is a gift of God, not to be found separate from him. So Ecclesiastes chapter 2, a verse we looked at much earlier, 
There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? Apart from him, where is joy found? And Solomon is saying nowhere. To enjoy life, to take pleasure in our work, to enjoy our work is described repeatedly in Ecclesiastes as a gift of God. Ecclesiastes has told us why that is. Why life needs to be connected with God. Because God has put eternity in our hearts. We long for something that isn't Hebel. We long for something that isn't temporary. We long to connect with something more that matters and will last. And Solomon, through the Spirit of God, tells us this is only in God. I perceive, Solomon says, that whatever God does endures forever. And through this journal journey, we finally reach the spirit-directed conclusion of it all. As we come to the end of chapter 12, and we read, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment and every secret thing, whether good or evil. This life, Solomon teaches us, may be Hebel. It may be transitory, but it's connected with something that is yet to come. This life can be connected with the eternal God, which, as we talked about, makes the process of our life exceedingly more important than the products that we produce that will eventually pass away. This is the end of the matter. And we're going to return to this shortly. But I want to look at one last lesson from Solomon's journal in Ecclesiastes in his searchings under the sun. And the question that I have for us this morning is this. What will I do with the strength of my youth? What will I do with the strength of my youth? And I'm actually starting in chapter 11. Beginning in chapter 11, you'll see verse 1. If you have your Bibles, we'll be going through chapter 11 and 12 of Ecclesiastes this morning. It begins with a well-known verse. It says this, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. It's a verse that maybe you've heard in stewardship sermons before. Cast your bread upon the water, and you will find it after many days. And it talks about spending our lives rather than trying to preserve them. Similar to the law of the sower. You remember the law of the sower. You always reap what you sow. You always reap more than you sow. And you always reap in a later season than you sow. Solomon is saying something similar here. You cast your bread upon the water today and you will find it not today, but after many days. After many days, he goes on in verse 4 and he talks about the fearful posture that we sometimes have as people. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. And that verse speaks to me as something I would call analysis paralysis, where we analyze things and analyze things to concern about things to the point that we end up doing nothing. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. Goes on into verse 8, and he talks about a joy. He says, so if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is Hebel, temporary. Verse 9, rejoice, O man, in your youth. Rejoice, O man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Or in other words, it's not just about here and now, but the life that we live now will be connected with something yet to come. Now, Solomon's words here are decidedly gender one-sided, but it is his journal, and he's writing from his point of view. 
It's perfectly uh, valid for us to say, rejoice, O woman, in your youth. In other words, Solomon is saying, enjoy it. Enjoy your youth. But don't forget that this life is hebel, temporary, and that it is connected with something yet to come. That's the introduction that takes us to chapter 12, verse 1. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth before. I want you to consider that verse for a minute. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. That, that, that's the conviction. That's what he's calling us to do. Then he says this, before. And three times he uses this word before. In verse 1, in verse 2, and verse 6. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure with them. Before the sun and light and moon are darkened. Before the silver cord is snapped and broken. Before, in other words, remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Consider this in your youth. Enjoy your youth while it lasts. Before. Because he goes on to describe what happens next. Oh, the strength and vitality of our youth. The strength and vitality of our youth. Bodies are strong, no fluffy clothing, no jackets to hide the spare tire. No sucking in the gut. Nothing is sagging or dragging. The mind is sharp. You feel invincible. You can do anything. But Solomon is clear that it will not stay that way. It will not stay that way. Before, and he gives his illusions, the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. Clouds aren't supposed to return after the rain. Sun is supposed to be after the rain. But he talks about the mental state that happens for many as they age, where life becomes gray. In the days when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent, when your muscles and bones, when your body shakes under effort, and the grinders cease, your teeth, because they are few, and those who look through the windows, the eyes are dimmed. Before. I know some of you as youth here go, it's never going to happen to me. It is. It is. And those of you who are older, you remember. You remember when you were 18 and you thought 40 was old? And now you're looking back going, 40, I wish. I wish. Time and age changes many things. Hopefully wisdom is gained. And as our bodies age, we have to learn to work smarter. Partly because we can't simply muscle our way through life the same way anymore. In your youth, you could muscle your way through whatever and make it work. As you age, wisdom leads you to work smarter and not simply harder. Our sense of natural vulnerabilities increase. Charles Swindoll put it this way. He said, interestingly, the older we get, the more cautious we become on our journey through life. With deliberate and careful concern, we study before we step. We ponder before we leap, and we hesitate before we move into the open. Under the guise of ripened wisdom, we often replace the risk of faith with a tedious, methodical lifestyle of fear that borders on boredom. What's the result? Often we become crotchety and set in our ways. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. But I want to address, to begin with, Solomon has something to say to our youth. Solomon has something to say to our youth. And that is a question that I want to, to engage with, particularly for those of you who are younger. What will I do with the strength of my youth? Solomon says this, remember also your creator. Remember also your creator. And this is not meant to be an intellectual exercise. 
given that all of Solomon has written so far about where to find purpose and joy and enjoyment in life, all that he's written about the hebel of life, and, not being, and what happens when life is not lived in connection with an eternal God. He writes to the youth and he says, remember your creator. You see, often in our youth, we are insulated from experiences of loss. Not that we don't experience some loss and heartache in youth. Many do, and unfortunately, too many more do today than probably in the past. But our youth does tend to insulate us from the experience of loss. Your youthful strength can let you plow through obstacles. But eventually, the obstacles become bigger as your strength also diminishes. And dear youth, dear young person, if you have ignored God in your youth, you will be playing catch up later. If you ignore God in your youth, you will be playing catch-up later. My question is, what will I do with the strength of my youth? Cast your bread upon the waters, and you will find it after many days. For how we walk with God, or how we don't walk with God, in our youth can have a great effect on how we walk with God in our later years. Faith is like a muscle, and it needs to be exercised. It needs to be developed. Our confidence in God is developed through experiences of insecurity, where we believe God more than we believe fear. And it needs to be developed young. Your obedience to God, your response to God by faith, needs to be developed in the season of your youth. Your faith and walk with God will be much more resilient in your later years when life is harder and your physical strength begins to fade. I am so glad that God got a hold of my life early. Faith is like a muscle. It needs to be exercised. And the things that we invest in our walk with God today have an effect later on. It's true for the body, it's true for the spirit. I've spent 17 years in healthcare working uh, on the ambulance and in the lab. And I remember seeing people who didn't care for themselves physically in their earlier years in life and how much they suffered later because of that. It was one of those, it was partly because of that that, uh, that convinced me to take up running and actually take exercise seriously in my early 40s. I thought, if my investment in this now means that I won't be in the state of some of the people I cared for in the future, then it was worth doing that now. In a similar way with our faith, it's not that it can't be developed and grow later in life. It most certainly can. But when you walk with God, when your walk with God matters in your youth, then your faith and walk with God will be much more resilient in your latter days. I, like I said, I'm so glad God got a hold of my life when I was 14. I am glad for the work of the Spirit and my decisions to respond to the Spirit of God in my youth. And I believe that many a lukewarm faith among an older generation is because they looked at Jesus in their youth and said, I'll get around to it later. I'll get around to it later. But for now, I'm going to do this. There's time. There's time to, it's not that I'm disregarding God. It's not that I'm not interested in God in my life, in my youth. It's just there's these other things, and I think that God might get in the way. God might get in the way, and rather than entrust my sense of happiness, my well-being to God and God's design, I'm going to, I'm going to, Sow my oats. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to, it's not that I, I dislike God. 
but I'm going to get back to serious faith later on. For many, that later on doesn't come. Because when you let your heart drift from Jesus in your youth, you may not find yourself wanting to return to him later. Because something in your heart may change. I want you to catch that this morning. I want you to take that to heart. Because for many people, they look at God and they say, I will get around to him later. I'm not against him. I'm just not going to take it seriously in my youth. There's so much else that I want to spend myself on. But when you let your heart drift from Jesus in your youth, you may not find yourself wanting to return to him later. Because when we let our hearts drift, something within our hearts begins to change. And so Solomon says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Now I want to address one what I think is a serious faith challenge in the lives of many youth. I have seen it over and over again from the time that I was a youth in youth group right through to my years as a pastor. I want to I discuss with you, because maybe nobody else ever will, one serious faith challenge of youth that I want to address, and that's this, who you will spend your life with. Who you will spend your life with. Solomon, going back another chapter, going back into Ecclesiastes chapter 9, he says this, enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your Hebrew life that he has given you under the sun. He says, this life is temporary, but while you're here, enjoy, enjoy life and enjoy it with your wife. And again, it can be reversed. One of the challenges that many Christian youth experience has to do with dating and courtship getting to know those of the opposite gender that they just might end up sharing their life with one day as husband and wife. Now, you might think that that's a far-off thing, but I met the girl that I would marry when I was 14. And I used to speak at youth events once in a while, and I, I would say that. I said, look around the room, see somebody who's 14. That could be your husband. That could be your wife one day. And they did exactly what you just did. They went, oh, no. Ah, That'll happen. We met at 14. We had a friendship developed that turned into a courtship that turned into what will be 33 years of marriage this July. The Bible says this. Words that perhaps you have heard before. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Bela? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Maybe you've heard this verse before. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, a yoke is a joining of life. A yoke is a joining of life. It is an agricultural picture. It is a picture of a harness that you would attach to two animals and they pull together in the same direction. They are joined together to do the work, the task of whatever it is that they're pulling and doing and they do it together in the same direction. It is the same picture that Jesus had in Matthew chapter 11 when he said, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And Jesus was saying, what I want you to do, what I'm inviting you to do in your weariness is to join with me, to be yoked together with me so that we do life together in the same direction rather than 
Jesus is going this way, and you're going this way. It's the same picture. And here Paul says, for us not to be joined in that kind of a yoke, to joining our life together with someone who does not share our faith, our friendship, our love with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, dating is not a yoke, but it leads towards that decision. Now, I know, I know as I say this, small town church settings, the gene pool doesn't always seem so deep, right? Small town church settings, I mean, I know all the people around in my church. I, shoot, I probably am related to a third of them. Church isn't the only place that you might meet um, a future Christian husband or wife. But sometimes we look around and go, you know what? I don't see any Christian youth around me. I mean, there's just not the chemistry. You know, I just don't like anyone that way. But there's that guy at school. Or there's that girl on the basketball team in the next school or next town. They don't claim to be Christian or go to church or anything, but they're really nice. They're really nice, and they're a good person, and I really think I like them. And I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. And one of the hard things I sometimes have to do as a pastor is to seemingly step on someone's happiness. But God's word is meant to preserve our happiness in him, which is established through obedience to his word over the long haul rather than the short one. See, you're not yoked to somebody as you date them, as you get to know them. But when you begin to move your heart towards someone who does not share your faith in Jesus, your most personal and intimate relationship in life, you will end up living with a tension between your loyalty to God and your loyalty to your future spouse. You will not be able to be yoked to them with a common faith where you pull together in life in the same direction. Because whether you're young or whether you're old, let me tell you what the purpose of marriage is. The purpose of marriage is the glory of God. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And the church responds in a cooperative posture towards a wife. And we give a picture in our marriage, not just of romance and happiness and all those kind of giddy things of love. Those are all fine and good. But ultimately, our marriages are about putting God on display. And the reason for a Christian to get married is not first about romance and love. Those come, those seasons come, they go, and they come again. And I can tell you, over 33 years, they cycle on and off. And every couple I've done premarital counseling with, I've looked at them and I've made this statement to them. I said, one day, you will roll over and look and say, what on earth am I doing here? But it won't last forever. The purpose of our marriages and the reason that we get married is because we can better love and serve the purposes of God together than we ever could apart. That is why God tells us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Because when you move your heart towards someone who doesn't share your faith in Jesus, your most personal and intimate relationship in life, you will end up living with a tension between your loyalty to God and your loyalty to your future spouse. These words are meant to protect you from future hardship and heartbreak. Dear people, it's hard enough on your faith in a Christian marriage when one or the other goes through a season where they seem to drift from God, let alone when you start where a posture where one loves Jesus and the other doesn't.
Now, I know some of you will say, well, it works out. Sometimes they will receive Christ. Sometimes they will. But, dear people, that, that, that's in spite of you, not because of you. That's in spite of, that's a gracious blessing. Because once you are yoked in marriage, God does not give you the freedom to break that yoke. Rather, at that point, you're left with prayer and hope and ministry, hoping that they will come with, to Christ. But I have sat with more than one over the years who have expressed their heartbreak in their later years, wondering whether their spouse will ever come to Jesus and whether they will ever see them again when this life is done. And that's a heartbreak that Jesus wants to spare you from. Trust God with your future spouse. If you're a young person here today, trust God with your future spouse. Set boundaries in your youth that you will only move your heart towards someone who shares your love for Jesus. I mean, why do you want to get involved with someone who doesn't care about your best friend? If you're already walking down that road, you have some difficult conversations ahead. If they don't want Jesus in their life, for their sake, not just to make you happy in the moment, then don't let it go any further. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. To those of you in your youth, what will you do with the strength of your youth? Solomon's words from God, remember your creator in the days of your youth before. What you will find after many days, cast your bread upon the water and what you will find after many days. I found this somewhat heartbreaking when I read his words. Billy Graham was writing at 92 years of age. 92, and he writes his last book. Introduction to his last book, Nearing Home. And he wrote this, I never thought I would live to be this old. All my life I was taught how to die as a Christian, but no one ever taught me how I ought to live in the years before I die. I wish they had because I am an old man now, and believe me, it's not easy. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. For those of you here that are getting older, Yes, life can be hard in many new ways. And much of the change that you continue to experience are not the kind of changes that you want or are looking forward to. But the point Solomon is making in his charge to the youth is this. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Why? So that you will still be walking with Jesus in your golden years. You remember your creator in your youth so that you are still remembering your creator as you age. Don't let the frailty of body or the mental struggles you have with age become your excuse. We are to remember our creator in the days of our youth so that when we are older, we will still be walking faithfully and passionately with God. The mind begins to change, yes. You first notice it the first time you go into a room, and then you leave it and go into it again and try to remember why you went into it in the first place. And it happens all too soon. And it's true as you age, the forms in which your life and ministry take may change. But it is not over. If you are alive, let the breath of your body be for the glory of Jesus in whatever form that it takes. In my youth, in my youth as a Christian, many older Christians left me disillusioned because it seemed like they stopped living already. It seemed like they were so cautious with their faith. 
And yet if we have exercised our faith in our youth, we should be able to trust God with greater capacity in our later years because we have seen his faithfulness. But instead, all too often, all too often, we have analysis paralysis where we observe the wind and do not sow and regard the clouds and do not weep or reap. We don't have much time left, but I want to encourage you to spend some time with the story of Caleb this week. Numbers chapter 13 in the Old Testament. Caleb is this man, he's 40 years old. He's part of the 12 spies that go into the land of Canaan. Remember the story, 12 men went to spy on Canaan? Um, at least that's a song from Sunday school at some point. The 12 spies go to spy on Canaan. They come back and they give their report. Ten of those spies turn around and say, you know what, this is too big, we can't do it. Two of them, and Caleb was one of the two that said, yes, this looks scary, but God is with us. We can do it. We can enter the land. But Caleb and Joshua were overruled by the majority. See, that's the consequences, the consequences of the will of the majority in issues of faith. Typically in the scriptures are not a good thing. Forty-five years later, we catch up to Caleb. Forty-five years we catch up to Caleb after the Israelites wander in the wilderness due to a failure of their faith. Moses is now dead. Joshua is now leading. God's people enter the land. Caleb is now 85 years old. And listen to this. Caleb goes to Joshua and says this. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. Just as he said these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength, is, my strength now is my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakins were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. I snicker as I read these words because was Caleb actually telling the truth? Was he right that his physical condition at 85 was the same as it was at 40? I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. But for him, he sat there and said, I can still do this. And I will move forward in the strength and vitality that God has given me. And the passion that I had for obeying God and following God into the land in my 40s has not diminished at the age of 85. Caleb was still wanting to capture that hill for the glory of God. I want that kind of faith in my later years. I want that kind of faith in my later, later years. I want to remember my creator and live by faith and take the hill country that is before me. I want to remain a part of God's mission in the world and be a passionate follower of Jesus Christ right to the very end. You see, Solomon writes, the end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. In your youth, in your later years, and in the days in between. For this is the whole duty of man. One last observation. The word duty is an English addition in your translation. The word duty is an English addition in your translation. It is better read this way. To fear, which means to reverence, worship, and live in awe of. Fear God and keep his commandments. Live life out of a loving obedience to God. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. The word there means the all, the all of his everything, entire, all of your concerning of everything. He says, this is what life is about. This is what Solomon says the end of the matter is. To fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. This is what it's all about. My all for Jesus from my youth to my very end. And then 
into what is yet to come. That is the message that I trust we are left with from our time together in Ecclesiastes. Life is not hebel. It is not vain. It is not temporary or transitory when it is lived in Jesus. That is the message of Ecclesiastes. Life is not hebel when it is lived in Jesus. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before. O oh, youth, what will you do with your faith and love for Jesus in the strength of your youth? What will you do with it? And, O oh, seasoned saint, will you walk with Jesus passionately and faithfully to the end? Fear, reverence, worship God, and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. Please join us in standing as we sing a song about surrendering all we have to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. 
Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. As the Lord dismisses you, you are dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.